the study is all about reviewing indigenous people's policy and institutional grounding in the country. So we actually started looking at uh, ecological uh, integrity related studies before and just going around to the different uh, LGUs, different communities uh, from the zone to Mindanao. We've always encountered issues about IP rights, ancestral domains being affected by those other uh, ecological integrity related concerns. So now we are focusing on IP and IP related uh, policy and its grounding. And we start with the very basic grounding of policy, which um, in the country is very much embedded in our constitution. So the state recognizes uh, the inherent rights of ICCs, IPs, to self governance and self determination. So this is very much embedded in our 1987 constitution and grounded through Republic Act 8371 or the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act of 1997. So policy wise, we are covered. Implementation wise, we'll see later on uh, in the course of our presentation. So the objective really of the study is to conduct a policy and institutional review of IPRA and uh, look at how it's being implemented and grounded. We did several approaches in terms of looking at policy and looking at the institutions involved. Number one, we did case studies. We looked at uh, the NCIP central office uh, as the, the main institutional um, organization mandated to look at uh, IP related concerns. We looked at several regional cases, including CAR, that of the Davao region, and the Western Visayas. So all of these had their own uh, thematic uh, focus you know, in terms of grounding policy and in terms of their own very unique way of grounding uh, whatever we have in terms of IPRA and its provisions and in terms of what they have in terms of IPs and ICCs in their own domains. So we looked at policy, we looked at institutional structures, we looked at the implementation processes uh, among those regional um, coverages. So where are the IPs? Uh, we are looking at this graph and we see that uh, we have a lot uh, within the Mindanao area, as also mentioned by our president, Dr. Orbeta. So region 11 is number one with around 16.14%, region 12, 13%, region 10, 12% CAR with 10%, one with around 8.5 and uh, around uh, 7.2 or 3% for Region 2. I mentioned Region 2 because later on it will be highlighted in one of the graphs. So in Hi, terms Sir of policy, Sonny. Sorry to cut you. Can you just minimize the thumbnail videos on the upper part of your screen so that it's, it won't block the text? Thank you, sir. Yeah, how do you do this? I've been trying to, to minimize it. <laughs> Okay, there's an arrow button on the left side of the thumbnail. Just yes, perfect. And then just place it on the lower okay. part of your screen. Thank you, sir. All right, so let's continue with the presentation. So policy and institutional evolution uh, provides us with a glimpse as to how the country has dealt with IPs and uh, IP related concerns. All started way back uh, a century ago early 1900s during uh, the American period. And then uh, we had several uh, manifestations of IP related uh, concerns being grounded within our bureaucratic institutions. So, so you have here a uh, very major evolution in terms of what we have organization wise. Also in, in early 1900s, we had the first uh, accreditation of native titles, you know, those uh, related to native territories, territories being occupied by IPs and IP communities. So you have here RA 1888, 1957, Panamin 68, uh, in 1975, PD 690, 84, EO 9, uh, 969, and 1987, and then 1997, we have the, the IPRA being grounded, uh, well, being passed and then eventually grounded with 1998 uh, having its IRR passed. So in terms of uh, department oversights, you have here in the early 1900s uh, up to the mid 1900s, we have the Department of Interior. 
looking at IP-related concerns and organization. From 57 to 2003, we have the Office of the President looking at uh, IP-related institutions. 2004, <clears throat> 2007, we have the, the DAR, Department of Land Reform or Agrarian Reform. 2008 to 2011, the ENR. Then back to the Office of the President, 2012-2018. Present, uh, we have the DSWD looking at uh, NCIP as part of its structural uh, coverage. So just a visual presentation of how the landscape uh, was in IPRA. So we have here the Bureau of uh, Non-Christian Tribes, Panami, you know, 961, 969, up to what we have in 1987 and 1997 uh, upon passing of IPRA. Institution-wise, we have here as well, uh, probably the most important uh, starts at uh, around the year, 1984, Office of Muslim Affairs, Cultural Communities, and then uh, Office of Muslim Affairs, for the Northern uh, Cultural Communities and Southern Cultural Communities, which eventually were merged to form NCIP. Department-wise, we also have here the graphical representation of uh, where they are in terms of the umbrella organization. Timelines, uh, in terms of guidelines, <laughs> probably the most important is, well, you have in 1997, April, the past, following year, you had its IRR, being passed as well. And then eventually, um, you had um, specific guidelines in terms of grounding specific provisions in that policy. Most important is in 2006, you have the guidelines for FPIC and down the line, uh, it being revised in 2012. Um, the Ancestral Domain Sustainable uh, Development uh, Protection Plan in 2018 is also revised, uh, and that's a very important uh, milestone uh, within the guidelines uh, timeline for IPRA related uh, provisions and concerns. In looking at IPRA, we are also looking at uh, complementation with other existing policies you know, in other sectors as well as uh, overlapping of, of uh, supposed provisions and mandates of, of related institutions. And that uh, I think is the source for so many confusion, for so many complexities you know, in grounding uh, development related projects as well as in getting for example consens uh, consensus among IT communities in terms of projects and programs being grounded within their ancestral domains. Now looking at NCIP, uh, I think we have a very substantial organization with NCIP uh, and thanks to also the, the, uh, the base institutions uh, that were merged when NCIP was uh, established of IPRA. So you have, of course, the chairman, Commission and Bank, and the executive director looking at uh, seven uh, units and 12 regional offices. So this is uh, a very substantial structure in terms of NCIP as an institution, and uh, they have a lot on their plates. No? And I guess uh, there lies the, the challenge as well in terms of them making, making sure that uh, they are covering all their stakeholders, you know, as well as them uh, not being uh, very thin in terms of spreading their, their limited resources. Budget-wise, you have here uh, seemingly increasing budget allocation for NCIP. Speaking in 2019 at around 977 billion. In terms of expenditure type, you have here those breakdown, including personal services, MOOE, capital outlay. It's just recently that we've seen capital outlay being included in NCIP's uh, budget, and that probably is manifestation of focus as well in terms of uh, their programs and projects being grounded. In terms of uh, program allocation to operations for FPIC and ADS uh, DPT. Uh, you have it here. High allocations for operations at around uh, 2012-2014. General administration and support and support for, uh, to operations. So sharp increases in 2017 after admin turnover. There is ample resources given to field operations, uh, 
uh, but should have commensurate technical capacity from agencies uh, and its uh, personnel during utilization implementation. So in terms of allocated budget per sub program, you have it here. Top, uh, the top funded uh, sub programs are implementation of socioeconomic and cultural development projects, human and economic development services, indigenous peoples and cultural communities policy services. Funded the activities, number one, is the implementation of socioeconomic and cultural development rights at around more than 3 billion. General management and supervision, at more than 1 billion. And policy formulation, planning, coordination, and research uh, projects at around um, 637 million. There is a seeming uh, central concentration of um, resources. With, uh, if you're going to compare, for example, the NCIP central office with uh, those provided to sub regional offices, well, sub national offices. And uh, in terms of other observations, per expenditure type, central concentration with around 3.34 billion budget on personal services. Per program, central concentration with 2.82 uh, billion budget on operations. In terms of sub-programs, general management and support services, that's bigger allocation than ancestral land and domain titling services. Per object of expenditure, you have MOE, capital outlays, fixed expenditures and personal services, with personal services being higher than MOE. So I guess NCIP as an institution is well staffed and uh, well, they are paying for it in terms of uh, their yearly requirement for personal services. Trend of approved uh, CADIS and IP rights holders, you have it here. Um, in terms of um, the IP rights holders, you have CAR as the highest. No? But uh, in terms of area coverage of, of uh, endowed CADIS, uh, it's, it's not that high compared to the other regions. Region 11, Region 12, uh, they have <coughs> very high um, areas uh, for CADIS coverage, and as well as very high numbers for IP rights holders. If you're going to look at the umbrella organizations, during the years where um, there had been uh, high numbers of CATIs uh, and uh, high numbers of IP rights holders as well. You'll see that um, probably the golden years were uh, the grounding of the IPRA was uh, during the time of when it's, the NCIP was under the ANR as the umbrella uh, department. So that's around 2008, 2010. In terms of difficulty in accomplishing CATI targets, you have it here. You know, in terms of all the other targets, I think NCIP has done very well. Uh, they have higher accomplishment compared to targets. The only uh, targets were they have less you know, in terms of accomplishments where the percent of CATIs, CATIs awarded, the compliance with existing ADSPP, ADSDPP, as well as uh, approved uh, CATI CATIs within the year. That says a lot because uh, those are major indicators of uh, success in terms of uh, NCIP counting its uh, mandated uh, functions as, as, as espoused by policy. FPIC wise, we have a very encompassing uh, process flow here. And if you can see, I think this is substantial and probably there are two phases to this. The substantiality of something like this is also uh, part of the complexity in terms of grounding it and eventually getting the right consensus among IP communities as well as IP uh, individuals themselves. FPIC concerns, there is delay in the provision of guidelines, first issued in two, uh, 2006 and then revised in 2012. Processes are costly. Uh, community assemblies are mostly represented by council elders and so it, are not seeing really proper representation among uh, 
well, the base of the IT communities uh, in some cases. Consensus only need majority of the votes for some regions. NCIP offices are not endowed enough to reach um, and leverage all IB communities. FPIC process does not validate the, the legitimacy of an indigenous political structure, possibly compromising the consent process. And this is very important in terms of concerns we're looking at eventually. FPIC as a tool itself in terms of getting consent from IP communities is very important. But if the IPS uh, it's not really well it's questionable then and probably the end result of the process is also questionable there is sparse ip representation supposedly uh, there are uh, ip representations in several levels within the bureaucracy national subnational subregional municipal bar barangay and local levels but uh, we have yet to see really ip represent representatives uh, leveraging the very much uh, bounded uh, authority given by law in terms of them mixing up with the other represent, uh, representations in those uh, bodies and units down the line. There are several programs for capacitation and empowerment, as you can see here. Educational assistance uh, development programs, school mm, of living traditions uh, of NCCA, Philippine Indigenous Peoples Ethnographies, or pipes which I don't think has been passed, and social protection programs of government, academy, and uh, CSOs. <clears throat> so we have here our case study sites and uh, seeming analysis or summarized version of the core rights that we looked at. We have CAR, we have Davao, we have Iluido. For, uh, for CAR, probably, the most evident uh, manifestation of uh, APRA grounding is a very empowered IP uh, organization in, in, in the CAR NCIP. We have seen a very well articulated uh, leadership at the regional level, and uh, that is manifested in terms of grounding policy as well. For Davao, <coughs> we have strong local network among IP leaders. Yeah? And I guess uh, our very own Datu that's uh, going to, to be one of our reactors later on will, will be a testament to this. For Iloilo, we have seen uh, the less endowed version of uh, an NCIP regional office, it covering as well two regions. And it uh, still yet to cover um, a certain uh, section of the targeted population of IPs. So we've talked to IP is yet to be accredited by NCIP. So we have a lot in terms of articulated issues and concerns. Uh, we are looking at welfare and compensation. We are looking at tenorial security. We are looking at access to services, policy provisions, legal support, security, militarization, insurgents within uh, ancestral domains implementation and grounding, institutional support and collaboration. So the landscape is complex. We have a very, I think, a very comprehensive policy in place, although it's not perfect. But uh, in terms of what we have right now, grounding that policy over several decades, we have uh, a very complex uh, uh, situation or environment for, for IPs as well as IP policy grounding. Thematic concerns and recommendations. So if you're going to look at recognition, control, management of ancestral domains, including their governance, what we can look at going forward are well, the complete documentation of IPs, ICCs, IE. Um, and that includes uh, looking at uh, the settlers, their populations, the communities, and, and their profiles. Enhancing and capacitating IPS, uh, indigenous political uh, structures, as well as indigenous political organizations. Among those we talked to, these are probably the, the sources of well-articulated individuals among IP communities. And if you're going to have proper leveraging, you need these kinds of individuals you know, being part of the process and then being able to articulate the requirements of IP communities. 
strengthen community organizing among indigenous peoples and indigenous cultural communities. But we're going to look at uh, what you have local population wise. It's very important to have them, uh, well, the, the mass base of, of IP communities involved in, in all the processes related to um, FPIC or grounding policy. NCIP's capacity to deliver its mandate needs to be also um, revisited. Um, moving forward, we can look at restructuring, for example, the educational assistance program that they have for eventual professional service of IP communities, augmenting as well financial resources allocated to this. <clears throat> Ensure inclusion and complementation with other government <clears throat> programs. Coordinating anthropological research, demographic, genetic black work with academe and other sectoral agencies. Uh, committing to be long-term human capital investment to increase technical personnel, including social scientists, engineers, and legal support. Allowing non-IP technical personnel to aid in CAT application processing, as well as FPIC negotiations. So NCIP, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is substantial organization-wise. You just have to tweak uh, the organization probably in terms of uh, its composition. Or NCIP needs more technical people who are able to, for example, to do uh, geodetic uh, engineering work or social-related uh, research and work. In terms of ecological integrity concerns with ancestral domains, <clears throat> we look at uh, harmonizing policies and regulations within DNR, LGUs, and other government institutions. We look at ensuring application of, of appropriate indigenous knowledge and practices in preserving ecological integrity as well. Non-compliance and violation of the FPIC process. We can look at uh, augmenting legal and adjudication support, IPs as well as the NCIP offices. And look at also ensuring compliance by government uh, offices in enforcing the FPIC requirement. Number five, IP, ICC welfare and access to government services. Moving forward, we can promote equitable structured distribution of aid and royalties among IPs and ICCs. This is very evident, for example, in areas with mining uh, concessions. We are looking at just uh, a few families benefiting, for example, from royalties coming from mining operations with a lot of their base population uh, suffering from hardship. Ensure proper uh, representation in bureaucratic platforms. Pursue development and land productivity options in accordance with EPRA and IP rights. Pass the PIPES program. Uh, do demographic, uh, demographic survey to identify gaps in, in access to services per ethno-linguistic group. In terms of awareness on IP rights, uh, we should conduct IEC, more IEC campaign, provide orientation on EPRA provisions among um, not only the very obvious uh, stakeholders, but uh, probably among uh, the majority of government agencies that we have, agencies facilitating development projects and being grounded subnationally, the academe and the private sector as well. We can also look at enhancing interface uh, of EPRA provisions with other policies. In terms of self-determination and right, uh, the culture of IPs, uh, we can go for faster facilitation of CATI delineation, uh, which can be uh, outsourced no, to outside technical uh, entities just to facilitate the process. Mm -hmm. Reinforce effort to document the cultural structures and mechanisms of IPs and ICCs as these uh, help them ensure claims and legal rights, increase leverage of EPRA and related legal processes and documentations, and push for the declaration of legality or insulation of IPs, ICCs against security issues and state conflicts. There are, I guess, uh, a lot of complications. Uh, we're going to look at policy grounding EPRA wise. But, uh, I think the landscape is also rich in terms of entry points for intervention, in terms of us helping IP communities, IP individuals, and them getting uh, what's due to them, uh, and them actually being accorded uh, 
the rights uh, they should have. And that's the final slide. Thank you.